This is the Change Fail Podcast with Kevin Brennan and Julian Sammy. Episode 6 on June 28th, 2016. Incentives. You know you want to. You can watch, listen, and subscribe at change.fail. That's not change.fail.com. Just change.fail. Hi, Kevin. How are you tonight? Hi, Julian. I find thank you. Tonight we're talking about incentives and how incentives can fail and fail in big ways. Now, originally we were going to talk about incentives and then also really we were going to talk about perverse incentives. But given how complicated and complex incentives turned out to be, I think we're going to save the, the perverse ones for the next show. I want to know what you think of when you hear incentive program. Um, what I think of is somebody trying to mess around with compensation in the hopes that they're going to get more profit out of their workforce. So something doomed to failure. Pretty much, yeah. Well, so we know incentives work in specific circumstances. Like if you've got an assembly line or a repetitive task that is well characterized and and very simple and very linear, incentives can really drive performance. We know this from Dan Pink and from the the stuff that he he worked on with um, Drive. But when you're talking about people who work in an office, you know, you get these weird side effects when you try to do even the simplest incentive. See, the same problem, honestly, with most metrics programs. And a big part of that is that people do what they're incentivized to do, as I said. I mean, they actually do do it, but they don't do necessarily what you wanted them to do. They do what it is that you base their monetary compensation on. I started writing an essay about perverse incentives, And I ended up writing about just what the heck is an incentive and finally ended up with basically a two-pager that talks about what incentives actually are. And I think what you are describing is how they're commonly understood or misunderstood because people will, people talk like an incentive supports a goal, but the reality is that an incentive drives one or more behaviors they they may oppose your goal, or they may support it. They may support some tertiary goal or the, the actual stakeholder's goal. And so you can end up with these complex webs of interactions where all you really wanted to do was, say, increase sales by 5% this year. I want to sort of break down my thought process with you and get your feedback on it as, as I break down these steps to see if it holds together because it may not i think it does but it may not and so my starting point is everything you thought you knew about what an incentive is is mostly not right well so there's a nice simple modest introduction to the topic so incentives as you understand them today have vast gaps that you can drive a truck through Right. So the core assumption behind most incentive programs is that if I provide you with more of X, you will do more of Y, right? If I sure. give you a higher commission, you will generate more sales. If I give you more vacation time, you will make better use of the time you have when you're in the office. There, I mean, fundamentally, that's what the incentive is trying to do. It's trying to alter behaviors of staff. Here's the thing. What you've been describing is a combination of behaviors and goals and incentives, but the incentives don't actually tie directly to your goals. So say your goal is to increase sales, because that's a really simple one, and the incentive that you want to put in place is a bonus program. The part in the middle there, the behaviors that result in increased sales. What behaviors are you expecting? Let's go back to not the behaviors I might expect, but behaviors a typical person who's putting together an incentive program might expect, right? The idea is that they're, they're figuring that if they increase the rewards that people get from making sales, then 
salespeople will be more motivated to go out and get that next sale, or they will push harder to complete a sale. Um, and it is true that, you know, a lot of salespeople are very motivated by their compensation, and if they are incentivized to do so, often will seek to generate more sales. The problem comes, comes in that that is exactly what they will do. They will generate more sales. They will not generate other things which you might be hoping for. So let's keep it really simple. Who are the who is generating more sales? Because I'm the boss, I'm the executive, I've set this goal. I don't care if, you know, Alice and Bob each sell more. I care that Alice and Bob through Zach all together sell more. Alice could sell less and, you know, a bunch of other people could sell less as long as overall sales for that department go up. Because my sales target is not that my average sales per, per salesperson has increased. It's that my sales have increased. So we have a disconnect between the goals. There's the goal that is mine as the executive. And then there's the goal that is theirs as the, the stakeholder or as the, the salesperson. And those aren't the same goal. Right, let alone the goals that might happen in other parts of the organization. So say you're talking about a consulting firm and you have on the delivery end, the goal of actually having satisfied clients. One way to, <laughs> but one thing that often happens, the more you incentivize people to bring in sales, the more likely it is that they will bring in bad customers or customer, or they will cut corners to make a deal because that's what they're incentivized to do. The goal that you have as the as the boss is not the same as the goal you are setting for your your people, and so automatically there's a uh, misalignment in motivation. Now, if you're careful, you can find ways to align those things, but you're unlikely to align them if you don't know that they're actually different. Yeah. So if the product division is incentivized based on you know how many products they get out the door they'll push products out the door right Let, never mind if those products sell or if they conflict with each other and that brings up to you get to one of the fundamental problems of most incentive programs which is that they are not oriented around the overall goals of the organization those goals have been broken down into various pieces and each incentive program pushes towards optimizing one piece of it, even if it's at the expense of the rest of success of the company. You can get into a state that's a, called a local minimum or a local maximum. You might have a, a set of conditions that you want to achieve where you say maximize sales, but you find yourself trapped and it takes effort to get out of that. There's no smooth curve taking you up from low performance to high performance. There are these local positions you get stuck in and that you have to really work to push the organization out of. And when you're in that situation, what typically happens is that it act things actually get worse as you try to push them towards another stable local maximum. Sort of by definition, they have to get worse before they get better, which means that no matter what you do, you're you're trapped in a situation where you're going to have to lose before you can gain. Let's talk about a real world example that a lot of our listeners may well be familiar with, um, and that is the Agile Manifesto. The fundamental assumption behind the Agile Manifesto boils down to, you know, working software is the primary measure of progress. That's not a bad idea. There are certainly worse ideas, right? Uh, you know, nobody out there has tried to say that the volume of requirements documentation is the primary measure of progress or should be the primary measure of progress. Well, except for BAs who can write a lot in double space and then get paid per requirement. Fair enough. That is no BAs. No BAs get paid that way. Lawyers get paid that way. BAs do not get paid that way. Yeah. And so one of the reasons that this becomes a actual local optima is because it's 
not as obviously stupid as the requirements documentation example, right? That for sure. a lot of companies, it makes sense to say, hey, I wish we could make more software faster and better quality. The problem is that ultimately, churning out more software is not what any company is in business to do, not even companies that are software companies. When you say it like that, my first instinct is to push back. If my company is paid to design, to build software, say, you know, we're, we're a consultancy that builds software for, you know, as a vendor for other companies, of course we're paid for software. But really, we're not paid for software. We're paid for my client's capacity to do something that they couldn't do before. You know, to be fair to the manifesto, in the scenario you've described, you're getting as probably as close as you're ever going to get in real life to a situation where working software equals value. Is more code a better thing? Is Microsoft Office 20, I don't know, 18 or 19 or whatever going to be better because it has X amount more code? Of course not. But it becomes even worse in cases where you're talking about banks or insurance companies or other organizations that are not really about producing software. In which case, the question is, is the soft is the software enabling the company to do something it couldn't do today? Working software is definitely a local optimum. What should you do about that as a manager? I think we're not done figuring out what an incentive is. We got part way there and probably further than most people ever get when they're thinking about an incentive program. We've identified a few factors. One is that there's never only one incentive. Humans actually have every day, all the time, a whole host of incentives. Many of them are internal, things like autonomy and mastery and purpose, and loss aversion, and optimism bias. There's a whole host of these internal drives and motivators that tell us who we are, and whether we're worthwhile as people, and these are a kind of incentive. Because remember, incentives drive behavior towards a goal that I have. They do not drive behavior towards a goal anybody else has. So if I, if you're my boss and I share your goal, great. The incentives are going to work for my boss and for me. If we have different goals, and we probably do because we're different humans, then any incentive that you impose on me is going to end up with some strange results because I need to be moving towards my goals before I start moving towards your goals. And that step is almost never accounted for in, in an incentive program. The end goal that the boss has or the company has is conflated with the one goal and the only goal that the, the employee is supposed to have. So... If, I look, if, if I'm thinking about my, my comments right now, the Agile Manifesto and Agile Software Development, you know, what you're talking about is like a scenario where, you know, on top of whatever that internal bias tends towards, say you're paying developers based on the number of lines of code they write. Now, that's a very naive metric. I think anybody who knows sure. anything about development is going to say, oh, my God, that's insane. You know, right, or pay people by bug fix. Yeah, that's an, e that's an equally bad, uh, bad one. It's like, woo, I've got to code me a new minivan. Right. So in the interest of simplicity, well, oversimplifying for the sake of a discussion, we can take those as being real things that people have done because, you know, anybody would never do that. If you want to move beyond that, then you got you got to start asking, well, what is it that is going to incentivize developers to think not about how do I produce more code, but how do I produce better, more valuable software? Is it better, more valuable software? Or is it something higher level like um, better outcomes for our customers or better outcomes for the business? And that's where it gets hard, I think, because the problem is that at some level you could say, okay, you know what? I'm going to incentivize you based on, you know, Joe Coder, who's working away on some application in the back, based on our company's overall financial performance. If you're sure. Joe Coder, it's like, okay, you know, 
I would like to build software that does that. I don't have visibility to tell me if I'm doing that. So what that tells you is when you're building an incentive program, even a simple one, you have to account for several layers of motivation. And one of those layers is the overall organization. Another is probably the local group. And a third is the individual. There could be other factors too, but if you're not thinking at at least those, le those three levels, whatever incentive you put in place is going to end up doing things that you don't want or is very, very likely to do things that you don't want. Yeah, and I think the way I would put that is that you're talking about uh, the individual zone of control at one level of, in of incentive, right? The things that I yeah. can and cannot control. Then there are the things that I can influence, right? That's a good way of putting it. And then there are the things that are outside of my scope of control entirely, as far as I can, I can tell. I can affect the end state of the organization if I screw up my code in a way that shuts down the bank for a week. And you may be smiling because the Royal Bank of Canada got shut down for a week because somebody didn't do checksum validation kind of stuff on a text input field and someone entered a deposit of star 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 instead of 888 and it said okay and the way that mainframe systems work at banks right down to practically to the bare metal is that you cannot reverse anything ever that's not allowed it's happened it has to be done if you want to, if you made a mistake and put in 10000 instead of $10, you, you know, reverse that by saying minus 10000 and then you put in a positive 10. How do you put in a minus star, star, star? You, you don't. I mean, I, that, I actually remember one incident from long ago when I was working at a bank where, you know, a vendor who had, they brought in their own system and the executives were sitting with, you know, one of the analysts and they asked her, so... Okay, explain to us. Show us how you can get rid of a mortgage in, our, in the system. And she, write, you know, she goes into the keyboard and types "purge" blah, blah blah blah, and hits return. And they say, "Great, so you can get rid of a mortgage. That's cool. Now bring it back." And she looks at them and said, "What part of purge didn't you understand?" Oh dear. And so one of the, the I think within minutes they had a change order to remove that functionality from the localized version of the system it can be very very difficult for your people to see how they have a positive effect on the bottom line or on the customer experience or you know on the overall health of the organization it can be brilliantly easy for them to see how they can screw it up royally yeah and maybe even sink the company and that that can be an excellent starting point for developing a useful incentive program uh, where people recognize that they do contribute even if it's only to not kill the thing they love. Yeah, or at least tolerate. You know, of course, parenting came to mind. <laughs> yeah, but other than that example, and that is, I think, a good one, for, for the most part, you're incentivizing things that are either in somebody's zone of control or zone of influence. That's fair enough. When we break down incentives a little further, the way that I redefined the the nature of an incentive at like having gone through this kind of thinking is that you have a motivator applied to a stakeholder by a goal setter. You have a working code incentive applied to coders, developers, by a manager. Right. Now that's that's a long chain there. And we already know that the the motivators that are applied to that stakeholder, the things that drive the, the developer, they include things that go way outside the scope of working code. And there will be behaviors that are not what you intended as a consequence. Even if you make it very clear what your goals are, your your zone of influence goals are. Given that that's the case, the, one of the questions you need to ask when you're trying to create an incentive is, what are the other incentives? And what can I do about them? 
and I think this comes to a lot of stuff that we talked, you know, we talked about before is that people's incentives aren't simply financial. Most of our incentives are not financial. Under almost all circumstances, just whenever you see an incentive that's, that looks like it's financial as a dollar value, strike that out and ask, what will they use the money for? Then you're looking at an incentive. Money is not, unless you're a miser and like deranged, money is not the end purpose. If you're going to, you know, be Scrooge McDuck and play with your money in money bags, that's one thing. But that's not what normal humans do. We use money as a proxy for achieving something else. And if you're not asking what that something else is, you're in trouble. And even beyond that, though, there are motivators like wanting to be part of a team, wanting to improve your career, right? These are all things that can incentivize people to behave differently. I talked about, you know, Joe Coder doesn't necessarily have a sense of how his bank software is going to influence the bottom line other than I, I, I better not blow it up. But could he, is it plausible that he would care about, you know, do the end users like to use the software? Do they want to use the software? Is it helpful to them? And it's very plausible that that, level of that social incentive to you know be a strong team player and to actually contribute positively towards the business that employs him or her is something that would be a true motivator i agree with you i also find it delightful that you're so focused on the positive well, and i say that because you know, what about when your wonderful code that does all of those beautiful things increases our maintenance costs by a factor of five? You must be doing maintenance wrong. Or maybe there's a, con a conflicting set of incentives from coming at you from different directions, and... Perhaps that zone of influence should include some of the things that you can screw up as well as the things that you should be driving toward. And I, I'm very conscious of this because the model that I use for understanding incentives and, and many other behaviors at the most basic level is that people get pushed into behaviors by a loss or a potential loss. And people get pulled into behaviors by a gain or a potential gain. When you think about what an incentive program tends to be, or how an incentive program tends to be designed, they tend to be designed around, let's draw them in. Let's offer a reward for good behavior. Some are, of course, designed around, let's beat the crap out of them for screwing up. The trouble is that there are lots of ways that you can have a negative uh, effect on performance, that you can limit organizational performance while trying to enhance organizational performance. And the maintenance piece is an example. There are many, many other cases. I mean, you know, and this is more something we'll talk about, I think, when we get to perverse incentives, but things like stack ranking as an employee performance measure. I think the, the bottom line with incentives, whether you're an executive or a manager or an employee, is that incentives are never what they seem to be until you sit down and really model them out. I mean, I've developed a, a modeling notation, still working on it, uh, around incentives and being able to model out a system of incentives so that you have a better chance of predicting what kind of an outcome you're going to get. You're not going to be right, but you might be less wrong. And you'll probably be in a better position to adapt your incentive program before it actually sinks the company or, or turns into a perversion. I mean, an about perverse incentive. So what you're really talking about essentially is not that you're moving away from the fact that people are going to gain your incentive program to you know get the results they want but if you design it well enough the gaming behavior should also be behavior that you want to reinforce so the way i've described that is if you're going to make a bet don't bet against human nature 
And when I say human nature, I mean genetic, cultural, like the shoot works. Humans generally are almost completely identical. We're practically fungible in many, many ways. And at the level of, of, you know, incentives that we're talking about and the reason that people start to game the system and stuff like that, really we're dealing with some very, very basic aspects of human nature. Okay, so if you can't use your typical incentives to motivate a workforce, then are, what else can you do? One of the things you mentioned, gamification, is a, a very, very useful tool for helping you see ways to channel naturally occurring human human nature incentives into doing things that you want. So human nature, things like loss aversion or uh, social acceptance, you know, the desire to be liked, things like that, those are profound motivators. And if you include factors like that, in the incentive program, by definition, your incentive program is not going to be throw a bonus at them and let them go. It's going to take more time, effort, and money to set it up. But it may actually achieve the goals. And it may be sticky. Once people start to engage in it, you can start to shift the culture so that people want to be playing that game. Gamification is fundamentally about applying motivations and characteristics of human nature in a work or productive environment to deeply engage people in the behavior you want. If you're looking for, you know, the doctoral thesis on gamification, it's Las Vegas. Everything about Vegas takes aspects of human nature, all of them, every aspect you can think of, and makes it into something that you enjoy being a part of. When we're talking about incentive programs, you know, or incentives in general, we are talking about a very deep and profound aspect of human nature that can be used to great effect for good or the other thing. Because what you're really trying to do ultimately in creating an incentive program is pull everyone towards the behaviors that will result in the best outcome for the company as a whole, not for any particular group within the company, right? And push push them away from the behaviors that are damaging or which which uh, sub-optimize, which, which cause either direct losses or which hinder the ability of the company to, to achieve those goals that you're trying to pull them towards. So here's the here's the question I I would have then. So I I'm a manager and I try to design an incentive program for my team. What what can I do with all this stuff that we just talked about, right? What is it that's going to help me figure out where my incentive program is broken or misinformed or going to produce behaviors that I don't want? Because the problem is that you know as we said. Every incentive program drives behaviors, and most of them drive undesired behaviors. Step one, I think, is to take a step back, something that we've talked about before, and look not only at the incentive that you can put in place, your personal zone of control, but look at all the incentives that are currently pushing and pulling your people. And... There will be a lot of them. This is like doing a stakeholder analysis where you start off saying, oh, there's only two stakeholders. And then four days later, you've got a book with, you know, 600 stakeholders. So you really actually do have to deal with, you know, a hundred of them. So what you do is you start off with the, the incentive you can put in place. Uh, and then you look at all the other incentives you can find. And these will... By definition, I would start with autonomy, mastery, purpose, and uh, the the six or seven that are in uh, thinking fast and slow. Write those down. They may not all be relevant, but they totally could be. And at least some of them definitely, definitely will be. Then look at other incentive programs that exist in your organization today. You don't need to write them all down. But if, for example, people are being incentivized to lie about the number of hours that they work because you're only allowed to have 37.5 hours on your timesheet, 
that's an incentive. That's an incentive program that was not intentional. But it is something that is driving a behavior. If it's relevant to what you're trying to do, you need to take that into account. I kind of want to throw out, bring up the elephant in the room because we've talked a lot about how incentive programs can screw everything up. So let's put it on the table. Are incentive programs worth it? I think definitely, definitively, yes. In that narrow field that I talked about at the beginning, if you have repetitive, if you have repetitive work that is not about creativity, frequently it's, it's blue collar versus white collar kind of work, then incentive programs can be extraordinarily effective because incentives tend to draw attention in and narrow your focus and it helps people to do that one thing better. Now, when you're talking about the kind of work that a developer does or that a salesperson does, or that most of the people who are in our economy, certainly in North America, do, that's way too narrow. And it limits people's ability to actually solve problems and to actually deliver value. The kinds of incentive programs we've hinted at here, and we're not going to be able to design them for people, you know, in, in a discussion like this, but the characteristics of your incentive program need to, to include things like what kinds of internal motivators get these people to come to work or make them scared or make them turn away? And, you know, loss aversion is a huge incentive. How do you make that work for you? What is it that I can make my people afraid to lose that will drive them towards the thing I want them to win? It may be that there is no one incentive program that you can put in place for your whole organization that makes sense. It may be that you must have several tiers of incentives or incentive programs. So, I wish I could give you a better I, answer than that. Yeah, but you know, I think honestly, you kind of su summed it up. It, the reality is that in most cases, a traditional incentive program is likely to have minimal impact on getting people to do what you actually want them to do as opposed to some other thing. Most kind of white collar jobs, an incentive program may not be the best way to create the behaviors that you want to see. Let's be clear. An incentive program in the traditional sense is one thing. Creating a series of incentives or taking advantage of existing incentives, you could call that an incentive program but by breaking it back and thinking about the incentives, the incentives themselves, you have an opportunity. So let's take your, your salespeople example. Instead of putting an incentive program in place where you get a bonus for reaching a sales target, you put a, an incentive program in place, and I'm spitballing here, where you get a bonus for the performance of a partner maybe you put people together in sets of three and my bonus is based on the performance of the other two now when you do something twisted like that you're engaging things like mastery as a as a motivator for me to mentor my friends maybe not be my friend not actually be friendly but to encourage their ability to deliver above my own ability to deliver. And that kind of an incentive could take highly competitive people into a place where they must depend on their comrades in arms if they're all going to survive on the front. Yeah. I was just listening to a whole series of podcasts about World War I, so I have some, I have some strange vocabulary in my head right now. <laughs> yeah, I, I think... The challenge in sales is that sale, people who are drawn to sales tend to be people who are highly motivated by individual success and financial success, right? As opposed to other kinds of people who may have different intrinsic motivators. I can say that, you know, one of the problems I've always had with incentive programs is that 
most of these financial programs have never really incentivized me very much because I've been more motivated by the desire to do my job properly than by the additional financial award. We're starting to drift into our next show, which will be about perverse incentives. And, you know, the, the difference between a, a straight out incentive, whether it does what you want or not, is that with a, a real or a traditional incentive, you are going to drive a set of behaviors with the intent of achieving some overall goal. And as we've discussed, there's three or four steps that are generally missed or ignored or misunderstood on the way to achieving my goal. And it can go terribly wrong in lots of very direct and clear ways. When you start talking about perverse incentives, you're dealing with scenarios where you put an incentive in place, creates behaviors that directly oppose what you're trying to achieve. This has been the Change Fail Podcast with Kevin Brennan at BA Kevin and Julian Sammy at SCI underscore BA. You can also reach them on Twitter at CHGFAIL and Facebook.com slash Change Fail. Watch, listen, and subscribe at their website, Change.Fail. Remember, no dot com on the end, just Change.Fail. <laughs>